You will notice there are some familiar faces that are not here this morning. Uh, as I said earlier, our pastor, Albert Bird, is in uh, Ecuador on a mission trip. Uh, Josh, the associate pastor and our youth minister, uh, cannot be with us because he managed to contract COVID this past week. Uh, fortunately, there are some great people in the community that we can call on. Uh, I have known Commander John Scanlon off and on for several years because his wife and I taught at the same schools, and I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, he is a graduate of the Southern Baptist Seminary, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Albert and I kind of point that out to people. Uh, Josh, too. So we, we've got that. Uh, approved by the North American Mission Board and currently attached to, uh, you're, you're in the Naval Reserve Chaplain and you're attached to the Atlantic uh, Coast, Guard. Coast Guard, the Coast Guard. Okay. So I almost remembered all of it. But anyway, <laughs> please welcome uh, Commander John Scanlon to the pulpit this morning. Mr. Rockhold, thank you for that uh, very warm uh, welcome. If you have a Bible this morning, and I trust that you do, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to pick up our text for the morning in verse 7. 1 John chapter 4. All right. I'm going to read. I'm going to breathe a word of prayer, and then I'm going to get us into what the Lord has for us this morning in his word. 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Um, here's what uh, the disciple writes. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God has been made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, let, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13, by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in this world. Join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love. We are grateful that you are love. And this morning, uh, my prayer is that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are pleasing and acceptable to you. Father, give us ears to hear what your word says. Father, your word has power. Your word is true. We've heard so many voices from so many others, um, but we know this morning that you speak truth. It was your voice that called Abraham to leave all that he knew for a place that you would show him as he went. Father, it was your voice that uh, called Moses um, back into Egypt to do what you had asked him to do. And with fear, he went and, and obedience. Uh, we saw your power. And Father, it's that same voice that we so desperately desire to hear this morning. So Father, we pray that you speak to us and allow us to leave this place more like your son Jesus than we got here. In his name, in the precious name of Jesus, amen. So I hadn't run a mile since high school and I was 30. <laughs> And I thought, and I had prayed through this decision, but I had made it a prayerful decision after being out of seminary for a couple years and working on uh, serving on church staff that I was going to join the Navy Reserve as a chaplain. Now, Jenny, my wife, wasn't excited about this idea. 
Uh, she had not necessarily heard the same word from the Lord, but um, she had run a she had recently run a marathon, and so she didn't want, she knew that one of the first things that would happen when I uh, after I raised my right hand and headed off to uh, the chaplain version of basic training, which is still called Officer Developmental School, which we affectionately describe as as basically boot camp light or all the love a Navy chief can provide for five weeks, um, that there was going to be a test, a physical readiness test, and that was going to involve a pretty reasonable assessment, um, looking back on it, um, reasonable if you've run a mile more recently than high school, right? But so it was like a mile and a half run, a reasonable amount of push-ups, a reasonable amount of sit-ups. And Jenny, though not excited about the idea of the Navy, she didn't want me to die, like on a mile and a half run, at least not at that point in our marriage. And so she did not, like she didn't want that. Um, and so she had, having run a marathon, she took me out. So by the time I got to Newport, Rhode Island for officer of mental school, I could run a mile and a half without stopping, right? Now you would need a lunch and a sundial like to time this whole thing, right? But when I got there and completed this assessment, I was so proud that I had finished it, like still on my feet, alive, and, and I was, and I will say with pride, like I was not in last place, but I still to this day don't remember the name of the girl who was behind me. <laughs> like I don't. And so, like I think that most of us, I, I, don't, I have not met a person yet who, who likes taking a test, but most of us actually do understand the value and the reason for tests. Um, whether you're in the Navy and you're testing physical fitness um, or you're a teacher who is being tested in order to gain certification to, in certain subjects or you're a teacher giving a test because you've taught a certain amount of material you're, and you're looking to really determine whether or not people um, have met specific standards. And that Webster's in, in his dictionary in 1828 really defines a test in that way. He says this, and I'll just quote it. He says, that which anything is compared for proof of its genuineness, he provides an alternate definition and says simply a standard. A, a proof that something is genuine. Now, as we get into the text that the Lord has for us this morning, the verses prior to it, John introduces the idea of a test, and he teaches us, and I'll draw your attention back to verse 1 of chapter 4, though I did not read it just now, when John says this, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have, have gone uh, into the world. I mean, John says explicitly what most of us here today know intuitively is that not everyone who claims to be from God is from God. Not everyone who stands at a street corner and holds up a sign that says, you know, that they're from God or that they speak for God is from God. Not everyone who has a Facebook a site or a blog or something that they've identified as a ministry. Not everyone who writes a book or has a TV show who claims to speak for God is from God. So what does John say that we're to do? We're to test the spirits. We're to test to see whether or not do they, do they declare the gospel? Do they declare that our only hope for eternal life in this life and a life to come is it's salvation that comes in Jesus Christ alone? Do they proclaim the authority of Christ in all things? Do they proclaim the authority, the authority of God's word in all things? Test them, he says. And after he, kinda, after he sets up the idea and the need for us to test the spirits, in a way that we've heard this morning, he returns to a discussion of love for the third time. For the third time, he circles back to love. And it's not because he ran out of things to talk about. I mean, the, he comes back to love in, in this epistle be, for the reason that love is incredibly important to God. Why? Well, because love, and here's, here's the big idea for the morning, that love is the true test that reveals genuine faith in Jesus Christ. So what's the problem? Well, if we're being honest this morning, if it's just us, you know, 
and we're being honest, most people, include most of us, we really are bad at love. We're just bad at it. It's, it's ironic. It's not just Christians. It's Christians and non-Christians. Most people, they don't feel loved. They long to be loved. Um, they long to find and develop meaningful relationships and to have emotional companionship in our marriages and to love our kids and to teach our kids to love. And, but at the same time, we often find that elusive. Yeah, and, and culture finds it elusive. I mean, often the world, as they observe um, the, the hypocrisy in the church, often throw that back into our faces, really with a, with a perverted definition of love, or in a, at best, a badly misunderstood definition of love, is that looks at us and says, hey, like, you guys, like, you just don't know how to love, the world says to the church. I remember recent, not not that long ago, there was a Senate confirmation hearing of what would, what, who would become the Secretary of State, Monk, Mike Pompeo. And one senator in particular had really come back to uh, Secretary Pompeo several times because Pompeo is a, is a Christian. He, in public remarks, he had, um, what we would say had rightly said that homosexuality is a sin. And this senator just went back, and you just kept going back and back to him. But what, remar- what caught my attention was that sometime after the hearing, this senator followed up in a Facebook, a social media post, and here's what he said. Mike Pompeo pledged to me and over and over again that he would treat all under his leadership with respect and treat them equally. And the senator went on to say, but I'm not sure how you truly lead others, and not to mention love thy neighbor and still hold a, f- a fundamental and innate part of who they are as a perversion. He went on to muse about like, his thoughts on the meaning of love, but he ultimately said this, and this is what the senator said. He, he and I are Christians, and we believe in the ideal mandate, love thy neighbor. Now, here's, here's the challenge, and it's the challenge with love. It's the challenge, and that senator speaks for so many people in a lost world apart from the gospel, is that I, I, when I hear that, Um, In the context of love, I think about, uh, and this is going to date me, but I think about the movie Princess Bride, (laughs) okay? And and if if you haven't seen it, you owe it to yourself, right? And there's this, there's a line where one of the characters, Vincini, I think it says, is basically saying this word in inconceivable over and over again. And the main character, Inigo Montoya, confronts him at one point in compassion and says, you keep using that word, and I don't think it means what you think it means. Like people throw out the word love and you just want to stop and say, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And as we come into the text this morning, there is a fairly simple question that I hope that we can ask this morning, which is what does our love re- reveal about our relationship with God? Like how do I, and how do we test love? to know whether it's true. And this morning, God's word and his authority, he, he helps us with the answer to that question. And he does it with really three essential observations. Here's the first one I want you to see this morning. If you're taking notes with me, look back with me for a moment in verse seven. And for some of us, again, this will date me as well, but you can hear, some of us can still hear Salty the Singing Songbook sing this along with Charity the Church Mouse. But I will, my gift to you this morning is not gonna be to sing that song. Um, and so, but here's what it says. He says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Why is love so incredibly difficult to find? Well, part of the reason perhaps that it's incredibly difficult to find is that love is a verb. I mean, he begins here with the imperative. It's, a, it's an instruction, um, really a command that love is a command I must obey. Let us love one another. And since love requires obedience, love is by definition a choice. I mean, you've heard people say, Anthony, you can't help who you love. It, you can. It says it right here, right? You really can. So why, and coming back to the text, so why is love a command I must obey? Well, he gives us two things. One, he points to the source, right? He says love originates from God. But then he says that love is a divine attribute of God. Now, just for a moment, there are, there are two different types of attributes of God. There are incommunicable, 
right? And this basically attributes that God has that he cannot share. God is all-knowing. He is, all, he is ever-present. He is all-powerful. You are not all-knowing. <laughs> I am not ever-present. Um, and we, uh, I don't know everything. I can't do everything. And I'm not everywhere at the same time. Those are qualities that can't be shared. But there are qualities or attributes of God that are, that are communicated or shared with us. God, when he tells us in Galatians that the, spru- the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those are qualities that are by nature God. And at the same time, they are qualities that are they're attributes that are shared with us as children of God. And they're communicated to us. Now, how are they communicated? Well, he says it here. He said, anyone... Anyone who, does not, anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. This is the love of God that was made manifested among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. So, what, so how is the love of God communicated to, he, to us? Well, two things. One is it's communicated to us through a new birth. We are born of God. I mean, Paul will say, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if, anyone, if any man is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creature. At the same time, it says love is communicated to us through an ongoing relationship. He says this, whoever loves has been what? Born of God, verse 7, and second part, and knows God. So this love that comes from God is shared with us in a, as a divine attribute, as we walk with God, as we spend time with God in his word and in prayer. For application, how do we test that love is from God? Well, it's not our, we'll start with what it's not, right? It's not our feelings. It's not my feelings. It's not your feelings. He, the nowhere in here does he say, you, you can trace this whole Verse, I I went through it a few times in preparation for this point. I couldn't find the word feelings. I went looking for it. He also says, know what's also not in here. It's not what's culturally condoned in the moment. So that doesn't define love. What does define love? This, This book, love is defined by God because love comes from God. You cannot separate love from truth. You can't separate them. I mean, love... True love submits our emotions and our affections, the things we care most deeply about, to God's, love, to God's authority and to God's word. And because of that, God's standard of love is how we're tested as believers in Jesus Christ. I have three kids, um, I, 14, 12, and 10. My wife's name is Jenny. This past summer, we celebrated 17, this summer, we celebrated 17 years of marriage our oldest is 14, and she's going into high school. And I'll, I've got two girls and one boy, and dating terrifies me. It terrifies me. And not just because I have two daughters, which I do, and not because I hate all boys everywhere, which I do. <laughs> and not, so not just because of those things. Um, dating terrifies me for all my kids. Why? Because I really desire my kids to love and be loved, to be married. I want them but I want them more than I want them to be married, to be able to test love with God's standard for truth and not merely their hearts. My heart, their heart, your heart is just as Jeremiah said, it's deceitful above all. And when they, when they are in a, a relationship, whether friendship or romantic at some point, does this per, not, it's not just does this person love them, But is this person in a love relationship with a holy God, born into a new relationship and and growing in affection for Christ out of an ongoing relationship with him? Because that's how we test love. Why? Because love is from God. Let's look at a second thing with the time that we have. The second thing I want you to see is because love is from God, God sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die for our sins. So I spent... Um, so I'm a Navy Reserve chaplain, which means that the reserve is designed to be a part-time complement to some other full-time work. I, but I spent the last six years where the Navy Reserve was my full-time job in a recruiting role. So 
Six years ago, when I had started that role, I was one of the things that we would do is we would help prepare applicants for an interview. Well, I was new. And I was cleaning, like anybody who starts a new job, you're kind of playing catch up, there's a learning curve, you're cleaning some things. And so as one particular applicant prepared for the interview, I had given them some general instruction, which was, hey, let's talk about what you can expect. Let's, and basically, it's a, and here's what I said, it's a professional interview, you need to wear a suit and be professionally dressed for the interview. Well, my applicant showed up for the interview in DC at the Pentagon, I was not the one there, a buddy of mine was, that's an important detail. Um, because they were wearing a green suit and snakeskin leisure, uh, a green leisure suit and snakes, white snakeskin boots. And, and then, like when they, the admiral came out to greet the applicants, um, and they were seated, and this is an important detail as well, and when the admiral like extended their hand to shake my applicant's hand, they extended theirs as well, but from a seated position. Some of you are old enough to know that that's bad. And, and they had to be corrected, and their day went about as well as you'd expect it was going to go. My, now, my buddy, um, like, he, text, he took a picture, and, and still, six years later, he still finds that funny, and he texts me that picture every now and then. The chief of staff for the admiral found that as an opportunity to, pr to provide all of us training on how to better prepare applicants with protocol for the Pentagon. Um, and um, from that point on, people made fun of me because I have like a, a two-page long document on what to wear, including what color socks and belt to wear, and we go over that the night before. Now, I read recently that when you go to visit the Queen of England, they actually have formal protocol training that they provide before you see her. I wish I'd known that. Um, and one of the things that's in the protocol training is that you don't say to the Queen of England, pleased to meet you. Why? Because she assumes everyone's pleased to meet her. <laughs> right? now, if she, now, what the training said is that it, what happens, though, is if she would say she's pleased to meet you, now, that's a really, that's a notable thing. As we come into the text this morning, I want you to see in verse, uh, in verse 9, he says, in this, the love of God has been manifest among us that God sent his only son in the world so we might live through him. In this is love, verse 10, not that we have loved God. Let's just pause there. There's nothing particularly special about my love for God. It's often incredibly flawed because I am sinful by nature. And, how, and even, if it was, even if I was perfect in love, why would I not love him? Creator of the universe. He who never began but always was being, who spoke everything into existence, almighty, all-powerful, all-knower, perfect in grace and loving. Why would I not, right? Not, he says here, not that we have loved him, but, verse 10 says, that he loved us that he loved us and sent his son to be the savior of the world, right? It says later, to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the heart of the gospel. The death of Jesus on the cross for our sin is God's greatest expression of his love for us. I mean, John, you'll remember that John 3.16 says, for God, who, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Here in 1 John 4.9, just as in John 3.16, John teaches us that God sent into the world his one and only son. His one and only son. Why? Well, to be, he says here, to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans not 1, verse 18, says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of, the, of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So what does propitiation mean? That's not a word you use every day. I mean, it simply means to satisfy the wrath of God. Every sin I have ever committed, past, present, future, every sin you have ever committed, past, present, and future, has noticed and, and must be punished by God. That's the good news of the gospel, is that in Jesus, every sin 
It has been satisfied on the cross. In love, God sacrificed his only son in order to satisfy his own wrath. You've heard it said before, or at least perhaps you have, that, um, that if, if you were the only person on earth, that God loved you so much that he would have sent his only son to die for you on the cross. Beloved, that's true. But hear this. If you were the only person on earth, he would have still had to because your sin required it by itself. My sin, your sin. And in that is love. God's perfect love originates in him, demonstrated on your bad days, on your best days. When you're tempted to ask yourself the question, even in your thought, does God really love me? He says, here, look no further than the cross for your answer. Not only does, not only did Jesus die for our sins, but beloved, God abides in us. So in the 17, I know I've said it a couple of times, but in the 17 years that Jenny and I have been married, uh, we've actually lived in 14 different places. Um, we, we moved here about 10 years ago, um, lived on the west side for, uh, for a good bit of time, moved on base at NAS Jacksonville for a bit, and about a year ago bought a, a house here uh, in, our, well, in the Regency area of Arlington. We're hoping that in his will that this is our forever home, right? We reflect back on God's providence in our life in ways that are expected and unexpected. It's amazing how we can often trace his hand through the places that we've lived. As you consider God's story, it's amazing how you can trace God's story through, the, through his dwelling places in the Bible. Now, this next part's a little nerdy, but I promise I'm going to try and make it worth your time. But one of the key words in Genesis is walked. Okay, God walked with men. He walked with Adam. He walked with Eve. He walked with Enoch. He walked with Noah. He walked with Abram. But as we, by the time we get into Exodus, a change has taken place, and he does not simply walk with men. He dwells or he abides or he lives with them. We see that in the tabernacle. You know, we're, we're one of the first sanctuaries was the tabernacle. Moses dedicated it. The glory of God came down and moved into the tent um, but the people, there's a pattern. We have a similar pattern. We sinned. They sinned. The glory of God departed. Did it ever come back? It did, right? So Samuel and David, they dedicated the, uh, they, res they restored the nation. Solomon built a temple, and the glory of God came and lived in the temple. But the people sinned. And there's a, there's a verse in Ezekiel that I won't harp on, but it really, it really haunts me, is that the, Ezekiel tells us that he saw the glory of God depart. He saw the glory of God depart. Now, did, it, did the glory of God return? It did. Where? In the person of Jesus. But then Jesus died for our sin. He ascended. He told us he was going to send us a comforter, and he did, uh, in, in the Holy Spirit. So, so where's, where's the, the, the glory of God now? Well, he tells us, right? He, he, when he said in 1 Corinthians, when Paul would write in 1 Corinthians, do you not know? that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. The glory of God departed from the tabernacle and the temple when Israel disobeyed. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit will abide in us forever. This background is incredibly important because we, as we come into the text, really picking up in verse 13, well, verse 12, it says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides, he dwells, he lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Beloved, love comes from God. The demonstration of God's love is, G is Jesus, but the glory of God is demonstrated in our love for each other. I mean, the love that the church has is the best witness to the watching world, not just of the supernatural truth of the gospel, which it is, but of the, super, but of the glory of God. Love, it, it's, that's, that's what he says right here. Our love for each other 
is a testimony to a watching world of the glory of God, his love. I was on, um, some time ago, I was on a carrier for um, for about a half a year, um, which is some of the most fun ministry I've ever had. Right, floating city of 5,000 people. Um, the Navy is a unique demographic. Like 53.4% of the Navy has them celebrate their 24th birthday. 94% haven't celebrated their 41st birthday. When I went to a carry hours 39, they thought I was 300. Right? Um, and, and we were in a planned maintenance phase, which means they were fixing the ship. And I don't understand any of the technical nature of what was happening. But I understood the pastoral implications. There was a lot of young people working really hard to get things done so we could transition from maintenance into what the, na- what the nation needed the ship to do. And one of the big inspections was coming in the reactor department. And they've been working in- very hard to prepare for this inspection. And there were outside inspectors that came on the ship and we were all, we knew, everybody knew it was coming. I mean, and this was a big deal on a big day. They weren't there for long. When they looked at the leadership and they said, you're not ready. You should call us back when you are. Now, I don't know the technical nature of what happened, but I knew the pastoral impact. And I began to understand from a pastoral perspective that leadership, that, that at the most junior level, they had done exactly what they were told, and they had worked really hard to do it. But at a leadership level, there had been a fundamental misunderstanding of what was expected. A fundamental misunderstanding of what was expected. Well, as I think about love, I fear that that's often true of love and how important it is to God in the church. Like genuine faith in Jesus Christ is revealed in love, and sometimes I fear that there's been a fundamental misunderstanding about how important that is to the gospel. I'm a pastor who I like to listen to a lot. He says, we cannot separate truth from love. We're not, we're not compromising truth on the world's definition of love, but for too long, perhaps we've become known for a commitment to truth and not for love. Love originates from God. Love is demonstrated by Jesus Christ on the cross. Love is developed in our ongoing relationship with him. And love must be lived out by Christians as we love each other. And love is the best testimony to the gospel, to a watching world, of the truth of the glory of God. What best reveals? Your love. I'm sorry, what best reveals your relationship with Jesus Christ, whether it's true and genuine? Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we're grateful for your love. Grateful for a love that originates in you, is is perfectly expressed to us in uh, in Jesus by dying as a satisfying payment for our sin on the cross. And Father, is displayed in us as Christians as a testimony to the glory of God. Father, I pray that you center us on, on a right understanding of love. That's our prayer. In Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen.